What's up, party people? It's Keys Dan with RadioWhat.com, DJLittleRock.com, coming to you live and in living color from the Radio What studios. And this is my podcast, What Makes You Famous? It's an extension of the RadioWhat.com internet radio station that I've been running for quite some time. And if you need DJ services, where do I always send you? Say it with me, DJLittleRock.com. One more time. DJLittleRock.com. Check availability and get a free price quote, and maybe you can have me at your next event. You know I like to party with the people. The people need to be entertained. Oh, my goodness. I've been doing weddings. Ah, I mean, in, in addition to my karaoke show that I'll talk to you in a second about, I've been doing tons of weddings. What a good time. Oh, today on the program, I have David Carr Jr. Oh, you've heard that name. Oh, you might have heard of David Carr Sr. as well. Ha! Huh. All right. David Carr Jr. Oh, you, you want to know a little bit more about him? Stick around because you're going to hear more about David Carr Jr. in the next few minutes. Hey, this week's shows, I have one public show, my my uh, regular Friday night gig. It's the one that, that keeps me in touch with the people, you know, because I do a lot of private parties, but it's nice to have that one public gig where people can just show up and be a part of the show. It's the video dance party karaoke jam on Friday night at the Rab in Conway, Arkansas. Yeah, they got a full bar. The kitchen's open, pool tables. They got a pool tournament on Friday night. So if you want to try your hand at playing pool and possibly make some money while you're waiting to sing on stage right next to yours truly, come on out to the Rab, Conway, Arkansas, Friday night, 8 p.m. until 12.30 in the AM. Always a good time. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, yeah, Saturday. Oh, weddings. Oh, I love it. I mean, I, I do get do corporate events and birthday parties from time to time, but I've been doing a lot of weddings. You know, if there is a wedding season, I, I get for me it feels like it's all year long because I do a lot of weddings on Saturdays and sometimes on Sundays. You know, I know Sundays I do some uh, birthday parties and you know a few of these. Uh, you know, sometimes I do uh, special special events on on Sundays, but. Uh, Ah, for the most part, Saturdays are made for weddings. <laughs> I get to be a part of the people's uh, best best times. You know, be part of their their families getting together. You know, two families becoming one family, and that's a beautiful thing. Had a wedding last week. Can't say enough good things about it. It was over at the Wagon Wheel uh, Wagon Wheel Acres in Dover, Arkansas. What a beautiful place! What a beautiful place for a wedding. It overlooks the the mountain, uh, so you're, you 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 get your ceremony as long as the weather's good, which the weather was very good. They have their the ceremony outside, overlooking the the mountain. You know, you'll see this big pasture, and then inside they have a barn. That's oh my goodness! They just keep working on this thing. And last time I was there, it was all open, and now it's all closed in, so it stays nice and cool in the summertime and. And warm in the winter time. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you if you're having an event and you're anywhere in the area, I think you could do very well with the wagon wheel acres in Dover, Arkansas. And photography by Morgan Beck. She was great. Oh my goodness, uh, she she got all the shots, <laughs> and she even posted a few on her on her uh, Facebook page. So uh, Morgan Beck photography. Yeah, can't say enough. All right, that's enough intro. Let's get into it with. David Carr Jr. I got him on Skype. So if you're listening to the audio version, I encourage you to check out the video version on my YouTube page, youtube.com forward slash user forward slash keys Dan. Skyping David Carr Jr. now. There he is. Oh my goodness. He knows. The man knows. Well, this part so far, does this sound any better? Dude, that sounds so much better. Now you know. Whenever okay. you're doing interviews, grab yourself a pair of headset, microphone. Just try to make this thing. I mean, because uh, technology is wonky as it is. <laughs> right. Absolutely. 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 Ex Excellent, yeah. man. Now, David Carr Jr., Keys Dan, how you doing? <laughs> Man, if I was any better, I'd have to be twins. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, I can tell <laughs> that you're a man of a certain age when you come off with uh, with uh, sayings like that. This is uh, been this around. Is... Yeah, I've been around for a little bit. You know, I'm 
Well, these are sayings you know, that I would have grown up with. I'm a, I'm a child of the, well, I was born in, in the late 60s, 69. I, I know you're okay, a little bit, okay. of, you're a little bit older than me. I was class of 86 and, uh, you know, okay, just, just okay. going through your bio, I don't usually do a lot of research on these things, but for you, man, yeah, I, yeah. I actually, I took a look at your bio. I've listened to some of your music. You, you know what? I, I need to change voices. I need to get into the quiet storm. <laughs> <laughs> I need to. I need to go back to uh, when I was down in Miami. I used to do a radio show at night, and it was called Dan in the Night. And uh, okay. I, I used to have. Uh, well, I used to have a lot of people call in and say, "Hey, this is Carol," and I go to bed with Dan in the in the night. And then I would play that nice that jazzy music, and, you know. And, and back then, I, I think it was on. Yeah, it was on Exito one hundred five point five, and I would play two English songs, two Spanish songs. But since it was late in the evening, they would be real easy, kind of you know grooving music, stuff that you would uh, right. go uh, t- take you take you into the nighttime, into the bed, and uh, right, right. And I right. know there was a lot of sax. A lot of sex. Oh yeah, man. back in the day, there was a lot of sex. A lot of it, it used to be a lot of good sex. Well, that's just it, know? man. Uh, sex to me in the seventies, late seventies, even into the early eighties. If you didn't mm-hmm. have a sex, you didn't have a song. You know, you got to make it groove. Yeah. Go ahead. And I know a lot of my, a lot of my, my, uh, the, the, all the people that it, that influenced me. My dad, Roy Washington, Stanley Turrentine, King Curtis. You know. Gene Amos and about the sound and the unique sound of per the e for each cat. Then they started telling this musical story in the music. You know, and back in those days, you had four, maybe five songs on an album. That was that was an album. You know, and and they were long, and these guys expressed themselves, and and you went on this journey, this musical journey with them, and and that's what I consider myself is still in this musical journey. And uh, three minutes of a cheerleader song isn't going to do it. <laughs> and it's and, and your music is always evolving. You know, I'm sure back in yeah. in '78 when you graduated high school, and even before that, when you picked up your first sax. I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at your bio. It says you picked up your first sax at 12 years old. Back then, yeah. I mean, what were you grooving to, and and who was teaching you about the music? The, at, at 12 years old, when my dad came in, surprised me with the saxophone. It's an old uh, con. I still have it. Uh, alto saxophone. He paid all of 20 bucks for. Pro, it was a pro horn, though. Some kind of way he conned this guy. <laughs> and he was a tenor player. My dad was a tenor player, so he got me an alto. He showed me how to put it on and where to put my hand. Then he put an album on. I don't remember who it was. He said, here's your mouthpiece. He had his on. I had mine. He just said, start playing. And I'm like, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, but he was surprised I'm getting sound out of this thing. And, uh, and then w- went from there, started listening to the, the, the veterans that were recording. I said, I'm going to record. And, and then my dad took me to one of his gigs one time. I couldn't believe what I was seeing and hearing. And it just kind of kept growing and it kept uh, burning in my gut day and night, waking up, thinking about it, going to bed, thinking about it. Then I wanted to write and, compo- and compose and I wanted to record and and it's that's still that's still burning in me as we speak. <laughs> well, let me let me uh, ask you a little bit about that. I, I'm already sensing that David Carr Senior was a musician and a, a playing musician, not just a you know a stay at home you know maybe fiddle around. Right. He was out there touring and and actually making a couple of bucks maybe off of it. But previous to that, I mean, because uh, you know when you da- when you have a a son, you you want to be able to bond with them. Uh, you know, and up till right. and twelve years old is a pretty, pretty uh, serious time in a, in a lot of boys' lives because that's when things start changing. Sure. And if uh, if you don't have a, a bonding unit with your son, uh, you know the, you might get you might lose track of him. And it looks like that's right, what, that's true. It looks like that's what your dad did. He said, uh, "You know what? This he's about to be a man. He's he's starting to get a, in, into his own." And uh, I want to make sure that I, that we have something to do together. Now, previous to that, uh, when you were bonding with your dad, uh, I mean, what kind of things did you do with him before he he, t- he showed you the music? Now, my dad was old school, so he was a he was a disciplinarian. He was a very loving man, and uh, but you know, uh, you did what the rules were in the house, and 
we lost my mom when I was pretty, pretty young. And so it was on him. And he moved us to Oklahoma and be close to his mom to help to help uh, to help him give him assistance on raising us. But he got me out in the country a lot to work out in the country with him, you know, with the hogs and the chickens and and uh, some real field work. And because he wanted me to grow up and all of us to grow up with a certain amount of balance as human beings in spite of the or the tragedy of losing my mom. And I kept begging about this saxophone thing. And he finally just went ahead and did that, but he didn't want to spring and get a brand new one because he couldn't afford it. And he said, this kid may or may not play. So he got me a, he, he, he got me a really nice one for, well, two, what, $20 that long ago? That's, I guess that'd be more like a hundred, two couple hundred dollars that way. <laughs> but still, that's so, a very smart man that he, he said, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, I, I want to, to cultivate, I want to to yeah. let the let, let the yeah. kid have the tools in his toolbox, but I don't want to spend a lot of bread because a lot of times, you know, hey, I want to be a dolphin trainer. Okay, you take him to Sea World. Hey, I want to be, <laughs> you know, I want to work on cars. You buy him a car, really, you know, and then they, mm-hmm. they you know, mm-hmm. a lot of kids will give it up after a couple of weeks, and uh, then you're right. stuck with a mm-hmm. with a five hundred dollar bill for a for a saxophone. And uh, you say your right. dad was a con man. Right. Well, you already told me. He's a musician. If he's a working musician, he had to be a, hu- a hustler of some kind, you know, because when you're in this oh, business, yeah. you got to hustle. <laughs> you got to, you know, because t- some, of the, some, of the, some, of the, some of the things I won't talk about, because they don't have to kind of go in the book. But, you know, <laughs> well, I hope I hope that you yeah. do write a book because everybody's got a story. But a musician that's been yeah. around as long as you, especially coming from a musician family. And I'm so sorry that you lost your mom at such an early age. But then Thank your you, dad, you. yeah, your dad has to take care of well, how many kids? Three of us. Three of three you. of us. I was older than three. Yeah. Okay, okay. boys, girls. Uh, one girl. She was in the middle, and my little brother. And oh. you know, being in the born in the sixties, well, yeah, because my mom back in the fifties, you know, they were like, you know, early in the game with a mixed couple. There's this big old six foot eight uh, black man with this you know, tall, real cute brunette Irish girl. So they had some ish, some things going on with that. And here they had these children that have uh, kind of mixed and you have all the civil rights stuff going on, stuff like those. It was a tumultuous deal, you know, uh, but he still managed to tour and uh, he, he managed to tour with little Richard for a little bit before Richard got real big. And, uh, he had offers, you know, I think B.B. King reached out to him, uh, you're, you know, to maybe go with him. But he had a, he had his he was making plenty of money at home. So he didn't want to hit the road and leave his kids. And, and he had you know, three youngsters at the house. So he stayed there with us. Well, this is a primarily a learning podcast and I'm learning from you, David Carr. Yeah. Being a touring <laughs> musician, you got to give up your family. But tell me about, mm-hmm. uh, you know, being from a, a, a mixed race. Uh, you're from Denver, Colorado. That's where you right. were born. Was your right. was your parents from them? Because right now Colorado seems to me that it is like a very forward thinking. Uh, everybody live and live and let live. I'm from Miami, Florida. Yeah, I'm half right. Cuban, half Irish, half Italian. I know that's three halves, okay. but I'm a big guy, <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> but I'm from Miami, you know, and I think I have first cousins that are black as night. Uh, you know, my Cuban right. cousins, and it used to be, yeah, he's not black, he's Cuban. A Cubano, right? A Cubano, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like mm-hmm. I didn't know black and white until sixth grade, and you know, right. it, it has to be taught to you. But you, growing right. up, in, it was was your mom and dad that they meet in Colorado? They did, because uh, my dad's originally from Oklahoma. Okay, and and another couple of friends of his, uh, they were a mixed couple, and they introduced him to my mom mm-hmm. in in, uh, in Denver. So. They, it's like love at first sight, and they were attached to the hip, and and uh, and, and, ch- and with all the challenges going on. So my respect for my my parents, even though they're both, I've lost them both now. It's, oh. As a older guy, I I respect them more and more because I'm I'm a middle aged guy. I can see life, you know, you know how it is. You get older, you just see life in a Absolutely. more appreciative, learned way, yeah. and. Uh, and I'm glad I'm here. 
I'm just glad to be able to see it. <laughs> well, you, know? you get a perspective on things. As you get older, uh, you become the teacher for the next generation. You know, once we get to you a hope. certain level. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, everybody has knowledge to impart. I mean, I'm, I'm looking. Mm-hmm. You know, at the setup that you have there, anybody that's listening to the audio version of this, I encourage you to check out the video version because you you have the tools to your trade. You know, you've invested time, money, sweat into this craft that you're that you've come up with, and uh, you know you you got your your you know your dad had the foresight to go ahead and get you that that uh, that saxophone any yeah. way he could. He got you a good saxophone for what, what would be, you know, maybe a, a minimal amount of money, but not not chump change. You know, 20 bucks in right. the 70s is, uh, I mean, if I had my hand on 20 bucks, I'd be a, a king, you know, on in, in the <laughs> 70s. I'd be seeing Bruce Lee movies all day long, you know, riding my bike, right. you know, doing stuff. <laughs> but, I mean, you had, at 12 years old, what was I doing at 12? I think I was still riding a skateboard and playing marbles mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and trading baseball cards. But you picked up a saxophone, and that led you into the future, you know, which which ultimately became, you know, your career. Uh, you know, do you yeah. do you have a fallback option? Did your dad say, well, you you know, this uh, saxophone thing may or may not work out? Do you uh, why don't you go ahead and study this? Uh, do you have any a- any 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 working artist mm-hmm. should have several backup plans. <laughs> You know, so you don't become starving artist. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's and you have to keep it in perspective. It, it depends. Like I lost my mind when my dad handed me my, the saxophone. Yeah. So it was going to be. I was never going to be in a situation where I could be like in a long term relationship where we we're going to have four children and come through college. Oh, wait a minute. There are three saxophones on that stand, and I'm still trying to do that. Let's see. That may not work for me. <laughs> you know, be able to provide for three or four children and, and still saying, uh, you know, I'm probably not going to make two or three hundred thousand dollars a year. So I keep all these things in mind so I can do what's burning in my gut still, <laughs> you know. And you always hope that it can, oh, you got that, that you got that five, that fifty thousand dollar royalty check finally. That's always in the works, you know. You it, know, it doesn't no happen. Telling. It doesn't happen all that often anymore. I mean, the, mm-hmm. the internet has changed the music industry so much. You used to be able to send sell albums and then make a living. Mm-hmm. You know, you you t- right. you'd sell four or five hundred, maybe five, uh, you know, five hundred thousand. You're hoping to be to make a gold or a platinum record, you know. But at right. least if you sell a hundred thousand records, yeah, you, you can make a living. You you you, you right. made your you made your money for that year, a couple years. You know, you at, at a you know. But there's, you, but there's still a way. There's still a way to, to hustle because even though it's a, it's evolving. Yeah. And being an older guy and kind of not, I can't keep up with every digital a situation uh, that without help. You just you kind of. I mean, I build computers. That was one of my side gigs, and I kind of do IT work and stuff like that. Self taught to do that, and, and uh, amongst other things. So I learned how to build my own studio, build my computers, be my own tech be my own engineer i didn't see all that coming you know teach myself how to play saxophone all of it but if it's not burning in you you know and you know i got a budget a certain way because i know i'm going to make a certain amount it may get kind of scary you know it may not be no check for two months yeah you know so yeah <laughs> or not so There's- you just have to love it and have people around you it, it takes people around you to support you as a as an artist it's real it's just that simple Absolutely, man. Da- David Carr, you're giving people gems. Uh, you know, you got to know the business side, or you're gonna you're gonna drown. And you got to keep up yeah. with the social media. You got to keep up with the electronics. You got to keep up with the times, or you're going to perish. You know, so and that's what, one of the great things about hooking up with uh, the uh, national entertainment with oh. Jill and JT because they TJ and uh, uh, they they you know this is my first endeavor. And signing a lot, signed a label deal years and years ago. This is another one. I said, well, uh, the young lady I produced and Jennifer Marler turned me on to him. I said, well, let me look into this. You know, and I totally dug them. And, and uh, I, yeah, I feel like they're going to work hard to kind of get me up a couple more levels, get this digital presence. And, you know, as I'm, you know, I'm, I'm uh, connected with you and you, you, you know, uh, you're a great personality, brother. I, I, I really dig it. 
I appreciate you. Well, I, I've liked TJ and Jill Santa Banez since. Uh, yeah. uh, oh wait, I, I got to say it the Spanish way, Santa Banez. Uh, since. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's info. That's information for me. Okay. <laughs> I've okay. I've liked them t- so uh, since the day I met them, and, and yeah. they do yeah. seem to care about the artists that they that they um that they promote. Absolutely, it seems that way. Definitely it, seems that way so far. It really does. It's a good team, and it's nice to have a team. Right. But you know, we're going, we're jumping ahead of ourselves. I'm still back okay. when you're 12 okay. years old, trying to figure out how, how to play this saxophone. Sitting next to your dad, who's the king of saxophone. He's and then you're going. You you're barely making a sound. How does a young David Carr learn how to play saxophone? David Carr Jr. is hard-headed, very, very hard-headed and focused. When he wants to do something, it's he obsesses on it. <laughs> so my first beginner's book, you know, they have these little kid songs. And so one song was, Old McDonald Had a Farm. So, and it shows you where to, to which key is what note and all that and so I was able to put that together, and when I did, I said, okay, now the world's in trouble. When I was able to play Old McDonald Had a Farm, I knew the world was in trouble. <laughs> it's those simple songs that give you all the yeah. notes, all the tools that you mm-hmm. need. Because there's only, what, 12, right. 12 notes, 12 chords? I, I don't, I don't it, know. I don't yeah, play there's much. like seven notes, and then you have, you know, this, it, it's a it's lot simpler than, than people believe until you, until you jump to a, a jazz, jazz guy, and all of a sudden you... Your, your mind's blown. You know, I, well, you know, I don't want my mind blown. I want music to come out. <laughs> okay. Well, the early jazz that you're listening to, and, and you stayed primarily in jazz. Did you, did you ever step out into the, into the pop, into the, the rock? Because that's all, uh, they, they all have saxophone as well. Uh, or is it primarily honest, jazz? Uh, 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 I don't consider myself a jazz player. Okay. I, I, because I, I I've got friends of mine that are saxophonists that are jazz players, right? You know, and you there's this really crazy John Coltrane song called uh, Donna Lee, and that's like the challenge for saxophone players. If you're a bebop player, if you put Donna Lee in front of me, I'm just gonna sit there and look at the chart. <laughs> so you, you know, know how to read but music, you, but you put a, you, yeah, because you but you put a band together and say, man, let's groove. I will burn the place down. That is so, something that you you go to a jazz show, and I've been to quite a mm-hmm. few. If you just want to groove, uh, you know, grab a, a, a you know a drink with your friends or or mm-hmm, have a, mm-hmm. a nice meal. If you got a mm-hmm. good jazz quartet or a jazz trio, uh, or even a solo sax, man, right. just sitting there right. playing maybe with a backing track. Oh, yeah, your your night is made. It, it gives right. you the, it gives you that background. You've had a hard day. You unwind. With a little saxophone, and you say you're not it's a jazz a, player. Give you a little bit of escape if it's done well. It gives you an escape if the cat is doing it well, and he takes you on that little journey. It takes you. He's telling you a story. And you're like you're into his story. You forgot what's going on with you. Yeah. Oh, this cat's trying to tell me a story. He's not saying any words. It's just coming out of his horn, coming through the music. No words. That's what at, I love. No words at all. And yet you <laughs> are taking people on a journey just by the way yeah. that you play the high part. The low part, mm-hmm. stay in the middle. Mm-hmm. Then you know, mm-hmm. hey, it was a it was a bad day, but then it got better. And then it was, yeah. you know, you, you're, you you can take people, you could sing without even singing. Now you don't do any vocals at all yourself. I, I you know, back in the day, I used to sing quite a bit. Okay. I have a decent singing voice, but my love is that. That crazy saxophone. That's what my love is. So, and you know, some of my albums and some of my songs, I do. I do some background vocal stuff. I say, oh, this might be cool for a little background vocal. And I'll sing that. And a couple songs I did some lead stuff because a friend of mine is a hell of a songwriter. Uh, insisted I sing on something on one of my albums. So a couple of my albums, I'm I'm doing the lead singing on. Nothing to go. Oh my god, he's so great. It's just. It's nice. <laughs> well, where did you learn how to sing? Did you actually take lessons for that? Or is this no, something you were just... No, that was just... Because my daddy sang, too. Ooh. You know? I, I don't know if you remember... You might remember, like, this one song, uh, Rainy Night in Georgia, yes. back in the day. Beautiful. You should have heard my old man sing that. It was ridiculous. 
the girls would just start stripping and getting butt naked. I said, <laughs> <laughs> that is the power of music, the power of a musician. Yeah. And a lot of guys do, yeah. a lot of heterosexual guys do get into music because, you know, they want to attract the opposite sex. You know, you pick up a sax, you pick up a guitar, <laughs> you know, you that you become the lead singer because you want to attract, a, you know, a mate. Mm. Uh, you know, but that, you know, that wasn't your initial idea. Your initial idea was to pick up the sax and bond with your dad. That's what I'm reading into it, kind of. Yeah. At the beginning, right. Well, that was that was a lot of it. And then he finally, when he finally, a, four, a, a tender fourteen year old kid, he finally says, "You want to come play with me?" I, I mm. thought I was going to pass out. I didn't think I was going to make it to the gig. I was so scared, you know, because he this, you know, because I he was a blues player. So I'm, you know, on my way there, and he's playing, and he'd look at me and tell me to take a solo, and I'd take off, and he'd tell me what key it was, and then he kind of he wanted to test what my ear was doing. So a couple times he told me to take some solos, and he didn't tell me what key it was in. He said, "Okay, I didn't say nothing to you about a key. How in the world are you?" Do I said, "Daddy, when you talk to me about keys and stuff, you just confuse me. I, I hear you telling me stuff, but I don't even know what you're talking." About. He couldn't believe it. <laughs> I can't believe it. In two short years, this professional musician is taking his young. 14 year old son into a club. I, uh, you know, what kind mm -hmm. of gig was it? What, how many people were sitting in front of you and were they all having a good time? Packed. These places are packed. I'm sitting in front of all these grown people and, you know, and, and I, now, and believe me, but for, for those two years, I practiced so hard on so many different things, whether it be opera, touching on jazz, you know, mind you, I'm still in the high school. So I'm playing in stage band and, and I'm playing in the, uh, the, the, the um, oh, what do they call the morning band? It's just called a band. And I'm playing in the pet bands. I'm playing in the marching bands. I'm putting my own little combos together. I'm playing talent shows. So I, it's, I am a working hard little young artist. So by my dad heard it, and and uh, he said, I think this kid maybe will come on and do a little something. And uh, so I, every time I got a chance, I'd go play with him. That's a good you know, work ethic. Yeah. You, you've yeah. already told me that story. You're telling me yeah. that you any chance you got to, to to play that sax to pick it up and play mm -hmm. with somebody by yourself. Any chance you got, you played that. I mean, did that yeah. hurt? Did that hurt your your other uh, your, your other studies? Because you already told me you it, you know how to play. You did, know how to do didn't. computers. Yeah, but it hurt because I want to play football too. Oh, okay. You couldn't do both. Yeah, you have to play. That's you either have to play a band, you know, or uh, be an athlete. And I, you know, that saxophone. And then I left school early and, you know, because me and my dad weren't so much buddies. I'm getting older. So you know how that goes. <laughs> and I went to Marine Corps after my 11th grade year. All right. And, uh, well, what did you do yeah. in the Marine Corps? Well, I had a couple different things. I went in as a grunt. Okay. And um, uh, then they graduated to field artillery, auditioned for the Marine Corps band, and wound up in the band. What? In the Marine and Corps band? Up, in the Marine Corps. And then I played uh, with a local band there in California because I was stationed in Camp Pendleton, the 14 area. And um, then I found a, a local band there and played with them a bunch. You know, the Marine you know? Corps band, anybody that doesn't know, it's no joke. I mean, they're, no, they're, they're the cream of the crop. If you, they are. I, I still play a lot of times when they, people go, hey, will you play some like, uh, you know, just some classical music or or maybe like uh, some, uh, maybe some upbeat, some marches, and I'll, yeah. I'll go straight to the Marine Corps band and play mm -hmm. some stuff from them. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And did you get yeah. did you get recorded uh, when you were doing the Marine I did Corps? I did not get recorded uh with the Marine Corps band. Okay. I, I didn't I didn't get recorded uh, All right. and then my my stint was up and then I was out and I was going, I contemplated in should I stay in California or should I go back to Oklahoma? I went on back to Oklahoma. Okay. I'm gonna be back with my family and and of course you know, join with another band, immediately start touring the country, uh it was a song and dance band, uh, or dance uh, show band is what it was. Like a party band, yeah. like like you play covers. Yeah. yeah. Well, they were. It was like a fourth, the, the like a singing singing group. 
That's yeah. why I call them a show band. They were singing like four uh, guys singing, and they had a band, and that was a lot of fun. And did you, did you play co work. covers or originals? <laughs> Covers. It was all Cover. covers. See, now you're telling people, once again, you're giving people gems. If you want to be a yeah. touring musician, you can be in a party band, you know, where you yeah. play covers, learn about two or 300 songs, and you can play mm -hmm. weddings mm -hmm. and parties all over the country if you want, or real close to your right. your own backyard. You can you can work every weekend make and make a pretty good living. Not not great, but a good yeah, living. Yeah, you can. You know, or you could be that guy who wants to write his own music. And, and, you that, know, was, that was me. That and, was me. You wanted yes, you wanted more. Okay. Yeah. Well, you got out of the Marine Corps and and uh, you, you immediately got into a band. But when did the computers come up? Uh, were you studying that in high school as well, or or did uh, did you start studying that as the fallback? Well, it's kind of fell in my lap because I wanted the the technology was changing enough to where I thought I'm never going to be able to afford three hundred dollars an hour for the big studio there. Okay. But I knew I wanted to record. And oh. I'm, I'm producing and doing the four track stuff on cassette, and doing all stuff and and uh and so I'm always in the studio somewhere. You know, and I joined a band, had an eight track recorder, and I'm like, oh I'm in heaven and I'm gonna do all that stuff. And I still have some of those tapes. And when the digital era came around, I thought I can't, I'm not gonna be able to do this depending on uh tech support. I'm gonna have to learn this. And a friend of mine that was pretty tech savvy, just kind of babysat me through the initial, how to load an operating system. And I started saying, oh, this is simple to build. And then things kept evolving. Then you could buy parts for computers. So I just started building and, and doing my own tech work. What and, year is this? I, I think I built my own computer with uh, like components back in 2000. One or so, uh, maybe that's earlier, about right. Earlier that's than about that, right. earlier yeah. than that, my stepdad was uh, working for a, a like a like an IBM type company, and he he helped me yeah. uh, build like a, a computer to where I was a sysop back in the. So 80s. you re, you re, you can relate to what I'm talking about around the time and all that was kind of where the public could get their hands on it, and it and it wasn't so exclusive. You could like all of a sudden you start getting parts from like a place called Fry's yes. or something like that. You know, and uh, when I started building them, then I became a tech uh, tech support uh, for a lot of other people and uh, building systems for them and trying to help them upgrade without getting killed. Yeah. Oh, you need to know the computer when you just know it's infected with a virus. I can get the virus off of there and your computer would be like brand new. You know, on and on. Yeah, I well, remember. What about all my data? I can back all that up. You know, <laughs> I remember. Yeah. Uh, you know, everybody with a new computer, you had to have an antivirus software. I don't think I mm -hmm. run an antivirus software at all. Just don't go to stupid right. sites. You know, but all right, I, there you go. <laughs> you educate them. You educate them about don't go to crazy sites. You see something you know that looks strange, don't touch it. Don't click on it. Yeah, yeah. All yeah. that email. Uh, click here. We found. Uh, yeah. We found a problem with your bank. Click this. Yeah. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't. Hey, we need your social security number Ooh. so we can check on that for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that Nigerian Ooh. prince, he seems nice. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it, it could be, and it's, things are a lot more secure, but then there's a lot more hacking going on. So it's, uh, I kind of got out of the tech support and I still, I just maintain and still build my own systems to keep my production work going. Well, I mean, it looks quite impressive. Once again, the people listening to this, check out the video. I mean, you you got components awesome. back there. There's a there's a stack of components. I'm looking at it, maybe like a vocal. Uh, there's like vo uh, well, that that w one that's with the blue. That looks like something oh, I have yeah, in yeah. my closet. That's my that. uh, that's an oh, that's a, a preamp, an old school preamp. Uh huh. You know, and these are my sound modules for for sounds and. You know, it's and it's old school stuff. You yeah. know, that's my sound card. And that's my patch bay. And, and it, it used to be a lot more crap in here. But I said, there's a way to do this without so much crap. Yeah, but you got yeah. it streamlined. You got it in a stack. You got it boxed up. And the wires yeah. are hidden away. The man is clean. You go to yeah. you, you go to his little studio and, wow, he's got the right, yeah. you know, just the right amount of components and this clean. I'm, I'm surprised you're running a screensaver behind you, though. That that's kind of old school. That's kind of Windows 95. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That particular screensaver is a, kind of like a Windows 95 video because I'm still running Windows 7 on that thing because it just records. 
Okay. Just record. I don't surf the web with it and nothing like this. It's just to run my system. So as long as the operating system works for that, it doesn't have to be secure. All it has to do is run my run my uh, my recording software. Well, speaking of recording, all right. After you start uh, playing with your dad and you get out of you, you get out of the Marines, I'm gonna guess. Uh, I mean, we're, we're okay. If you graduated in '78, you get out of the Marines. Uh, what? Like seventy? What was it eighty? What is it, 80, 81, something like that I got out? It was like a two-year stint. And then you get yeah, back to, to Oklahoma and you start playing right. uh, for, for, with people by 82, 83. Right. Oh, my goodness, you've been doing this a long time. When did you start recording? Oh, when did you start, oh, laying, you know, getting together with people and, and start uh, thinking you might uh, make, put a record out? Okay. Did it take some I time? Think I, I, well, I had been thinking record from the – second i picked the thing up so (laughs) so i was i had just been recording and getting all this just recording and demo stuff and constantly recording and writing and writing and writing writing but it was it wasn't until i moved to texas when i felt like when you could actually own something that we record digital when the adats came out okay this is late 90s maybe yeah, I think so. I think so. And oh, okay. when you, I, when I fa- fa- figured out you could, uh, when it was available to the public, you could record digital in your own home. I said, okay, then it's it's over with. So I'm you're doing saying, my own album. so you're saying the uh, the eight track that you had and and the analog equipment that you had, you said you, you're thinking it, it wasn't up to snuff. You, it you was still- no, it wasn't going to be production quality. It was you you weren't going to have the. It wasn't going to be the clean. Oh. as I wanted it to be because you had to do a lot of it took a lot of effort to get uh, uh, analog clean as you wanted oh yeah I remember man and, and you know you listen to the you sounds know. of the 50s and 60s and even before that you know stuff that was on mm-hmm. 78s my my mom had a Victrola and and she played she I think she had two or three 78 records and I loved listening to them but they right. were so tinny you know and, and that was mm-hmm. the early days mm-hmm. of recording but you imagine those people back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, oh, that's listening to what that, they had. their minds were blown. Really? I don't mm-hmm. have to sing this live? I don't have to go, you know, <laughs> to record? And then what was it? Oh, I just recently heard about in the 40s when radio used to be all live. And Bing Crosby, being the smart guy that he was, he used to do two shows a night, one for the East Coast, and then he had to do another one for the West Coast because they were mm-hmm. they, they their time was different. Well, when the recording equipment came from the Nazis, un- unfortunately, unfortunately, that's the you know the German technology uh, in the war you know was was building up. That part of their idea was right. uh, to have recording <clears throat> equipment. Well, Bing Crosby got a hold of some of this. He recorded his first show live, and then the second show, he's back home on the couch. They played that. <laughs> they played that. You know that second recording. It wasn't great. But it got him out of doing one show, and he could spend some time with his family. And, you know what right. we were talking about earlier is uh, if you want to be a live musician, it might take you away from your family. Now you said you were touring already in Oklahoma back in the eighties. Did you have a family? Did you have a a love interest at the time? Well, I'm a musician, so you have you have love interests. <laughs> but I mean, were you foot loose and fancy free to where I, no, you were tied down? I, I just got married in the past. Uh, we just celebrated our fifth fifth year anniversary. I'm sixty one years old, so never were know, married so, before. And uh, I've just waited late because I, I just kind of kind of felt that as long as I'm doing this, I'm not, not making long money. The odds of me maintaining a relationship is. That is the life of a musician, man. That is the life of a musician. We already talked about B.B. Mm-hmm. King, uh, where he mm-hmm. he had a song, and I know I brought this up on this podcast before, but he had a the, the one line from B.B. King that I remember is the, the life of an entertainer. You go to work at 9 p.m., you know, <laughs> and, and you, you get off work just about the time the sun comes up. You know, right. that you work all night, and it's hard on a family. And, and yeah, so you had... But when you, the love, but when the, when the love is in you, when the love is in you, yeah, and there's more to it than just a gig. And there's another song to be written. There's another journey to take into the musical thing. You can't give up on it. And it's not like, you know, a few people didn't try to get me to give it up to live another type of life. Yeah. That was not going to happen. 
You made a choice. Okay. David Carr mm -hmm. Jr. made a choice to put the mm -hmm. music out there, the, the music that you had in your heart, in your soul, and music to you, that you didn't even know was in there until right. it finally came out. You know, you've been doing, you've been writing music since you were 12, 13, 14. Uh, you know, yeah. you've been playing your own stuff, but it really didn't start getting recorded. Or, or you stay, you still have tapes. What, what's the, what, what's the earliest tapes you had? How old were you back then? Um, I was, well, see, if you want to say the earliest one was when I took a cassette player, mm -hmm. you know, portable and a piano, hit record, played the song on the piano, took another recorder, <laughs> tape recorder, cassette, push play on that, record on that, and then played sax while this one played the thing. That was my first multi, multi track. Now you're going back again to the early days of multi-track recording. All right, there was another another guy that would uh, record guitar on a on on one record. Then he would play yeah. that record and do harmonica, <laughs> and then he'd play that record and do rhythm, and then he'd play that record yeah. and sing along with it. And then he, like he'd have eight tracks because he kept recording <laughs> record after record after record. That is analog the man recording in the record. early days. He wanted to record. Yes. He had the music in him, just like mm -hmm. you have the music in you, David Carr. But you're okay. Yeah, you had those those old recordings that you feel like they're not up to snuff. You couldn't even take them to an engineer to go have a mix mastered. I'm not even sure what. Oh no, mix no, it's not is. even good enough to do that. It's just, but it is a great archive because I I still go through my archives and pull songs up from thirty something years ago. I wrote. I go, oh. I kind of like what you were doing back there, young man. Let's see. You know, and I'll, I'll start playing with it and going, oh, that turned out nice. You just had to do it then and wait till you got 60 years old to, to produce it properly. <laughs> hey, you had the idea, the wherewithal to go ahead and record that stuff because you didn't mm -hmm. know. You didn't know what you didn't know. You didn't know the future. Right. And here we are in the future. And you're you're laying down these tracks that you recorded uh, and and came up with all those years ago, and and we we the public have the pleasure of listening to them. Now I know on your YouTube page you only have two videos out there, uh, you know, uh, and and I I know if you look up your your name on YouTube you'll come up with the the topic. I need you to get those videos mm -hmm. and put them on your personal david carr jr okay. youtube page that way people can find them all in one stop shop and i know that there's a, a david carr um website david carr jr david carr jr dot com dot com you know where people can yeah. find everything yeah. about you man that nice bio that tells tells the story so succinctly how you you went around this country you know l learning things but when you went from and, and brother, I appreciate you kind of putting a couple more thoughts in my my head as far as okay, put a couple more things on that YouTube deal and yeah, because it's some of this I'm having to be educated through because I'm, I'm you know the I'm the artist that's like you know I've been in this computer thing for a long time and every time I turn around there's a new app there's a new Instagram there's new this I just want to practice and write music absolutely <laughs> but I have to get the music out there and you have to get this digital thing going. Well, and that's that's uh, so every little bit of information I get is is always helpful. Well, that's why you have the Nashville uh, record people uh, that are helping yes, you out in that respect. You need a team. The creator yes. wants to create, and if you could right. take take your whole time and not have to be you know talking to you know me. No, you, no. You, oh, you, I love talking <laughs> to you. Don't you say that. You know, this is I another. Enjoy to you. you know, this is definitely another way that hopefully you can get a uh, get the word out about David Carr Jr. Yes, sir. You know, yes, but uh, when you moved from Colorado, you, were you listening to cer certain kind of music? In Oklahoma, you listen to a certain kind of music. Texas is like its own country down there. Did you pick <laughs> up what? What did you pick up when you went to Texas? Did you pick up anything new? Anything different? Well, it's interesting. Because I grew up in a house where we listened to so much different kind of stuff, from Junior Walker to The Temptations to to uh, Curtis Mayfield to Superfly. Uh, I mean, really, and you know the, the the pop rock that was going on. It, it, I mean, I would rock myself to sleep. I don't know how many nights listening to the AM radio, listening to Chicago and and, and just all kind of different. Stuff. So I grew up with all of it, 
And I said, well, you need that. You need your own identity musically. That's that's what you're going to have to do. That's what's going to have to happen. And that's what I'm still pursuing to this day. Well, you're picking out my playlist for this weekend. I do club gigs uh, on Fridays and, and sometimes on Saturdays. Well, I'll, I'll do mm-hmm. par- uh, parties and stuff on Saturdays. But, uh, yeah, I, th- I think it's going to be old school. And maybe we'll throw a little David Carr in there. And I, I always, you might as well. Yeah, I always put videos up. And uh, when I play some of the, the newer artists or some of the artists that, that maybe have gotten to this level, but need to get to the next level, you know. But, right. uh, you know, people that are putting out good product, such as yourself, my job as the club DJ, as the radio DJ, is to put it out to the world. But, you know, yes, and, sir. and I'll play that in the club, and they'll put the video up, and they'll be like, who is that? And I'll go, that's David Carr Jr. You need to look that mm-hmm, up. Mm-hmm. You need to find out more about David Carr Jr. So, man, all right, we got we got to Texas, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, you were playing – in bands down there, did uh, and this is uh, late late nineties. You were starting to record. Late, no, late late eighties when I when I moved to Texas, oh, okay. eighty four, eighty five, eighty five, and and had a hot cover band I was playing in at the time, and we and we were writing and working on some stuff as a as most R and B, we we're more of a kind of an R and B band uh, cover band, and we were hot, and I was sneaking in a couple of my instrumentals in there, and and as Things always go. We have more. You have several people in the band. Everybody's got a different idea of how things should go. I'm thinking we should be trying to get in the studio, record more. And they're thinking about, about the next thing that chase on chase on the radio. Well, that's where I'm going to have to part ways. That's enough of that. I don't want to be 60 years old still playing breakouts. I love you, but I'm not doing that. Yeah, it's tough no, to be no in a band. No offense to a working musician. No offense. Yeah. I'm not. I don't want to be doing that. It's tough to blend personalities, and sometimes it just doesn't jive. You know, it was good. Right. It was good for a while. You made a couple yeah. bucks. You know, it was good. Uh, but and I'm still friends with most people I played with over the years. The ones that are just still around. I'm, we're still uh, close friends and stuff like that. And uh, I just, well, then I can be, you know, happy. So 14 CDs or albums later, I'm still not playing breakouts. <laughs> ah, that's beautiful man all right so what yeah. took you away from texas what got What's you out of, what got you out of texas what, what got me out of texas where are you at I'm now? still in texas oh you're I'm in, in texas, texas. So i'm oh. in grapevine texas well area. here i thought you went back to oklahoma but you ended up staying no in- no no i never i go back and see family and you know the, uh, uh aunties and uncles and stuff like uncles and cousins and but I uh, I've been living in Texas thirty almost thirty five years now. Well, I guess I didn't read the end of your bio or the <laughs> the end for now because the story has not been completely written. It's still because there's still <laughs> plenty of time left. It, cool, it, you know cool. for sure. And, but uh, you're in and around the Dallas area. People can find you. Are you playing live? Any uh, do you have a, any regular gigs? I've got a I've got a show coming up. I do with a, a really talented. Uh, uh, a Cuban artist, uh, Rolando Diaz, and he's really renowned worldwide. And we do a show called Passion, and uh, downtown Dallas at the uh, Euphoria Theater, where he paints this incredible work while I play. Hmm. And it is an experience that's hard to describe. More than you just have to buy a ticket to the show. That is what you're you know. doing, man. You're giving them visual. You're giving them yeah. audio. You're making them feel. Oh, yeah. That is, uh, and, and, and it, is so, I mean, it, it is easy for us to, you know, when I do open my eyes, kind of look when I'm playing, and you, it, it's nothing to find a few people sitting out there like tears coming out. You know, I'm talking about men and women. Oh, for sure. You know? For sure. It's, Some it's of the live most, concerts. It's a hot show. Oh, some of the live concerts I've been to, I, I, I've been balling like a little girl with a skinned knee. Yeah, for sure, man. <laughs> uh, you know, and, <laughs> and, and how did you know? How did that make me feel like that? The first time, mm-hmm. I think it was the uh, the Royal Regiments on parade. I've always been into like uh, uh, bagpipes and and dr- oh, and drums yeah. and stuff like that. And and here, uh, my my girlfriend at the time, she said. Hey, can we, the drum and bugle corps are coming from the Royal Regiments from uh, England or whatever, and we right. went and we saw this. And there are the bagpipes, and they did. Of course, they did Amazing Grace, and that one. By the end of that, oh, by the end God, of Amazing yeah. Grace on a bagpipe with a drum, I'm like, 
It's yeah, what, yeah. It, it's what music can do is make you feel. It's incredible. You, you change it's incredible. minds. Uh, you know, and, and just the two songs that that you have on your on your YouTube, they're fan. I mean, I, I'm listening to them. Uh, Mona Lisa, and then uh, yeah, you, that's you Mona have, Lisa. That's that's one of those ones I wrote when I was a kid, and then <sighs> got grown and went. I think it's time. <laughs> you had that one for all those years because that one yeah. is just fantastic. And jazz, yeah. you know, you say you're not jazz, but you know, what, what would you? I mean, you. Nobody wants to be put the in a box. Now the influence is there. Nobody course. wants to be put the, in a box. Yeah. Whether it be the whether it be the Miles Davis type or the Grover Washington, you know, the David Sam. Well, it's the influences are there. You could consider it a a, a a form of jazz, you know. But I just don't want to. I try to be careful about insulting the hardcore jazz guys. Oh, yeah. You know. There's a difference you know, between a, fusion a, 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 and you know uh, you know there's different and kinds. bop and straight ahead and. And, and uh, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of a hybrid, kind of an eclectic kind of player, but I rely heavily on the sound of my sax, you know, and, and, the, and the, what's going on with the rest of the story uh, musically. And because and, that's what got me into it. When I first heard a Grover Washington album, I went, what in the world is this cat? Oh, this is unbelievable. Nobody was doing it like that. Yeah. You know. Well, you talk that free expression, but with a with a structure that was so funky or so sultry in its in its uh, uh, sexiness, and in, in, in Bob James was producing that stuff early in the day uh, for Grover. It was so hot. Louis Johnson was playing bass on a lot of those tracks. It was crazy. <laughs> Oh man! Now you're making. Oh, when I get off this, I'm going to go into a, a, a nice R and B uh, and and uh, early early days. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to go on yeah. a music get, trip. Get you, get you, Grover Washington. Find his "Feel So Good" album and oh. listen to that. Oh, <laughs> it does. And not not to be confused with Chuck Mangione's "Feel So Good." It's a whole different. No, it's a whole no, different feel. And I love Chuck. Yeah, because Chuck is a bad man. Yeah, but Grover, right? And I, on that "Feel So Good" album. Lord have mercy. Well, I mean, you you have different people with different skills. You got, you know, Kenny yeah, G. That's what makes got, the world lovely. You know, Chuck Mangione, Kenny G, mm -hmm. Grover Washington, mm -hmm. and, you know, oh, you mentioned Booker T and Curtis Mayfield, yeah. Superfly. Oh, no. Yeah, I, see? I, I, oh. And then, you know, Prince, Prince, Prince is one of my major influences, you know. So I wrote a song in tribute to him uh, called Purple. Now. Where can we find it? Said, I, I, you can find it on iTunes or uh, uh, Spotify or Pandora. Uh, you can actually go to my website and get the CD, the album, if you want, because I actually did a single release and, and put it on an, on an album. But I'm just saying, when you listen to that one, just calm down. It's just going to it's gonna get you. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's going to get you. It's a beautiful song. It's one of my uh, – people request it all the time. It's a beautiful song. It right. features the soprano sax. It's all beautiful. Right. So people go into a David Carr, uh, uh, a David Carr, the experience. It's all going to be uh, original songs, no covers. Oh, no covers! Wow. Well, there's one. Okay. There's, there's one. I did a, a Michael Jackson uh, on my first album, uh, his Liberian Girl. I don't I heard think it I'm one familiar. Time on the radio. It was on his. Uh, was it off the wall album? And that's a great album. <laughs> Yeah, and I and I so I heard on the radio one time. I went, "Oh, I wonder what my tenor will sound like on that." So I played it live on the set for a while. And I said, "I'm gonna record that one." And it came out pretty nice. That's on my first album, Liberian Girl. Well, here I am, more than thirty years on the radio, and I I don't think I'm familiar with that song. Now I gotta go it's like, dig it's it up. A great song. And, and see, that's what a, a musician can pull out something that might be a little more obscure to to most people. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people that have heard that song, right. but there right. there's songs that that are a little more obscure from famous artists, and then you put your own twist on it. You put your David mm -hmm. Carr Jr. twist on it, and it becomes a whole nother song, and it, it, right. it, and it touches a whole nother generation of people. And, man, you have that, a... That's the hope. That's the hope. You want to... Hey, man, look, can I get you to feel what I'm feeling for just a little bit? You'll enjoy this, I promise you. You know? Yeah. Because if it makes me feel like this... And I'm not screaming at you or saying something weird through some type of crazy vocal line, 
It's all about love. It's all about the, the music. It's all about the, the journey. Come on, let's go on this little musical journey. Let's just go with me for a little bit. It's uh, all good. There's some people that are playing, you know, there's a, there's some nights that I'll get in a kick where I'll play covers that you didn't know were covers, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of that stuff was, was written so long ago. You didn't know, mm -hmm. Hey, that was a cover. Huh? Sometimes right. I'll play the original and then I'll play the cover and I'll go, huh? I didn't even know that was a cover. I didn't even know. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. You know, Stevie Wonder. Oh, is there. So I guess there is another cover I do. I, I apologize oh. for interrupting you because you brought the covers. There's oh, a go ahead. <clears throat> it was, it, Sanborn did it, and I thought it was an original. I thought it was an instrumental original called Lotus Blossom. So at, at some point, I want to record it. So I finally recorded it. It's on my third album. And I found out recently, I say recently, several years ago, that was not a David Sanborn song. That's a Michael Franks song. <laughs> That's originally Michael Franks. So I dug up a friend of mine, fan, turned, he's, oh, here's my, the original version. I went, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> Didn't know. Oh, these Didn't are definitely know. names that I have in my jazz folder that I'll play at cocktail hours uh, from time to time yeah. whenever I'm doing weddings or something, you know, and they want something light, nothing, nothing crazy Ooh. for dancing. I'll throw some of those, uh, uh, you know, definitely those, uh, those songs, uh, those jazzy records. Yeah. So David Carr yeah. Jr. is going into the mix. In the mix. You know? <laughs> You're a bad man. I appreciate you. Thank no, you so I much. appreciate you. I appreciate someone that can play music. I've had so many guitars. I have a full piano out there. There's harmonicas Beautiful. in the house. I can't play a lick. I have a 16-year-old daughter that can play pretty well, so I'm encouraging awesome. her to keep playing, keep on playing, uh, you know, cultivate. Yeah, I know she has other interests as well, but, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want – I want her to not lose the music because music helps in so – so many really respects, does. man. It helps you if you have a, a tough job where you're on, you know, Wall Street uh, working, you know, and, and your heart's about to bust out of your chest. You grab your little guitar, you grab your your harmonica, you grab your saxophone, and you could lower your blood pressure, man. Just playing, oh, for, even for yourself, yeah. you know, even if you're not playing <laughs> for somebody else, you sit there yeah. and you just strum out something, you know, you you put something out there. And uh, it's I, funny you would bring that up because through COVID. I learned through COVID that my body, it, my body wasn't going to do well without playing. You know, it's just this. It, it's one thing to practice that performance part. My body required it. I mean, it 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 did a number on me. Oh my playing. goodness! Those first two months, and I'm glad it was only those first two months where I had gig zero, and I'm used to having right. two, three gigs a week, and then right. I, you know, I have zero. And those, I was like, Jonesen, I need the people. Yeah, I need the bad. energy from those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can play for myself, but no, I need to but have. But that's not the same. Yes. Not the same. It you know, I can it, practice and practice and practice because that's that. But where's that audience? I don't care if it's one person. <laughs> I don't care if it's just one person in the seat. And that's why I did some virtual shows. And my, my, my wife and the other I We'd had my wife and me, one other person, because we were on quarantine around here. Oh, yeah. And and they'd be in there kind of cheering because they're true fans. And they'd be in there having a good time. And that would, oh, my God, that feels like, the, that feels like old times, you know. I have to sit there in the front room with my phone stuff blowing my butt off. And people are, they, they, my fans supported me beautifully and, and donated uh, to my website, stuff like that during the COVID thing, it was, it was beautiful and awesome. And they saved me. They saved me. They really did. Well, they I've, really did. I've said it on the mic before. If I can make one person happy, then I'm doing a terrible job. <laughs> Cause I need to make more people happy. And I, and you are, you're making people happy, man. You've made me Thank happy. You, uh, just the last hour that we've been chit chatting and I'm having, it's a know, pleasure. It's a pleasure to meet you. Oh you know, and it, it, immediately you have this uplifting spirit. That's really cool. I dig it a lot. Well, Thanks, I, I, like, I appreciate you. I like talking to people. I like getting the story. I like being engaged with people. And that's what I've learned so much about how you became who you are, man. I'm, I, you know, it's the seeds when uh, kids yeah. are coming up and that's, you know, at a, at a certain age, such as myself, such as yourself, mm -hmm. you know, we start yeah. to, to encourage the next generation. You don't want this, the skill that we have, the skill that you have, you don't want it to die. You want to make sure that other people that are thinking about 
taking up a, a, a saxophone. Now, how many different types of saxophones are you playing? I play alto, tenor, and soprano. And what's the difference uh, when you're when you're the, playing? The soprano, the soprano is basically a saxophone. The tenor, the the soprano and the tenor are both in B flat, and the soprano is an octave higher than the tenor. Okay. All I know about and G, B alto, flat is alto's in between. It's okay. an E flat. So they all have a different t- tonality, uh, tonality, a uh, personality to them. So they, you approach them, each approach each one a little bit different. It's like you had three children. You don't deal with each child the same way. It's the saxophones are the same way. You deal with the soprano one kind of way. And you deal with the, the alto a different kind of way. And the tenor. And they're all bad children. <laughs> These are horrible these are horrible children because they don't help you in any shape, form, or fashion. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're bad kids, but you have to keep working on them. You have to keep practicing on them. So I'm one of those fortunate saxophone players, and this is a, this is a 60-year-old man who has no more ego. But I'm telling you, I sound great on all three. And most saxophone players can't pull that off. They, they either sound good on one or the other one. They can play them all, but do you sound good on all three? I mean, I'm, do you like... Or do you excel from a, a tone standpoint from all three? And that's uh, so a lot of my saxophone friends are like, David, I hate you. You know, like, you know, because I'll think it's a piano and damn, you know, oh, the spato, man. The tenor, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they you don't know. hate you, man. I'm sure they appreciate you because. Oh, the, man, we're buds. We exactly. Learn. We the, all learn. The music yeah. community, it should be tight, man. Uh, we should it all is. be helping each other should. out, lift each other up, man. And that's right. and that goes for anybody that's listening in. Is any endeavor lift each other up? Don't step Absolutely. on each other. Absolutely. Don't step on each other. Lift yes, each other sir. up. Take Global care of yourself. Washington Junior told me. Yeah. You know, I apologize. I keep interrupting you, brother. I don't Please, need to do it's that. your podcast. You go. <laughs> I'll be here well, tomorrow. I, <laughs> I was uh, at what year? Was it t- nineteen ninety eight? I go to see my my hero for the third time, Grover Washington Jr. at Caravan of Dreams in Fort Worth. My uh, manager at the time bought tickets to surprise me and a friend of hers and took me to his show. And I'm losing my mind. I'm losing my mind. And she and they so I know she gets up and she comes back and she says, "Come here, don't you follow me? The show's over." And I, she takes me backstage to meet him. I'm thinking I'm going to pass out. This is Grover Washington. Jr. I'm going to pass out. He's this t- tiny guy with this huge personality, this big smile, and he grabs and hugs me like he had known me forever. It says, David, re- always remember there's room for everybody. I will never forget that as long as I live. God rest his soul. You met your you hero, know. man. Yeah, and, and, and he, had, you know. he, had that, he had that wisdom for me that I've taken into my uh, middle-aged life and it, and it, and it, he was right. There's room for everybody. That was a good experience. A lot of times people yeah. say, don't meet your heroes because they'll disappoint right. you. But he was, he did not disappoint. All right. No. Well, as uh, let's wind this thing down. I'm respectful for people's time, but I, I want I'm you to, okay. I, appreciate it. I want you to give shout outs to people that have helped you along the way. Uh, if you have bandmates that you work with uh, from time to time, people that, that have to, you know, and I'm glad that you found love. That's fantastic that you have somebody yeah. to spend the rest of your time with, man. That's 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 a bonus to have somebody special in your corner. Uh, and uh, absolutely, you know, but definitely give shout outs to people, and then we'll uh, wind this thing down. Well, the Mini Cats I'm playing with, like uh, uh, Bronco Carr, my cousin. He's bass bass. He he. One of the things he does is plays bass. He plays bass in my band, but he's a chef and and all kind of he's a huge uh supporter of me as a as a as my big brother and and as a musician larry davis has been playing with me for years incredible talent here locally larry dickerson guitarist rodney bowens one of the sickest musicians he's been helping me and influenced me for for years as a saxophonist he plays a bunch of instruments but saxophone's one of them uh, uh it, I could go on and on, but I think I'll I think I'll leave it right there, you know, because it, it's it's just a lot of people that have uh, right. helped me over the years. Lots of people. 
David Carr Jr., I don't want this to be the last time that we talk. As things progress, I hope not. If, if you get some new albums or or you got some shows that you need promoting, I mean, you don't have to spend a whole hour with me. It could be like you know twenty thirty minutes if you want to just get the word out about certain things or you got something new to talk about. That's fine. But I always finish these things off with last words for the people. It could be a words to live by, something you heard a long time ago, uh, maybe somebody told you, maybe a mantra that you wake up with every morning, or just whatever pops into your head at this moment in time. David Carr Jr., give the last words for the people. Like my old man said, David, your tone is the most important thing on that saxophone. That's the first thing you tell. Uh, I want other saxophone players to hear that. Your tone is the most important thing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. There you have it, party people. What a sweetheart of a man, David Carr Jr. He's been putting effort into this. He's been hon honing his skills since the tender age of 12 years old. He heard those records that his mom and dad were playing. And, uh, oh, my goodness, the rest is history. He just started emulating and, and adding his own influence into it. I encourage you, follow him around on his social media and make sure that you check out davidcarrjr.com and find out where he's going to be playing. I know he's playing mostly in the, in the Dallas area, but uh, you could get lucky. He could come to a town near you or if you want him to come to your town. Maybe you can just uh, slip them an email and let them know. <laughs> and uh, maybe he'll play for you. Yeah, David Carr Jr. I mean, he's got some sweet sounds. Definitely sweet sounds. Make you feel good. Make you, uh, if you're having a, a bad day, he's going to make it a better day. And that's what music can do. Music has the power to change minds, to, to influence your moods. Ah. Uh, Thank you, David Carr Jr., for being on the program. I appreciate you so much, and I look forward to talking to you again in the near future. Now, if you, if you, I'm turning my attention to you, would like to tell your story on the What Makes You Famous podcast, I encourage you to give me a call, 501-470-6386, or email keysdan at aol.com. That's it for this edition of What Makes You Famous. It's KeysDan, RadioWhat.com, DJLittleRock.com. Peace. I'm out of here. <laughs>